Hello, welcome to this session of Roots Tech Connect, which will be about births, marriages and deaths in Egypt. And my name's Penny Walters. Just to say that the content of this video, as well as the thoughts, views and opinions expressed herein, belong solely to myself, Penny Walters, and do not necessarily reflect the views of Family Search International or Roots Tech. This session will look at censuses between 1882 and present, and we will look at how modern day Egyptians officially register and celebrate or commemorate births, marriages and deaths. Egyptian naming systems will be covered and how to analyze people's ancestries from their names utilizing the chain system. Some regional differences will be looked at and the role of religion and the various types of marriage. Also, what does Egyptian DNA tell us about histories? Some useful Egyptian words will be given and a list of resources to investigate Egyptian family histories further. Here we can see Egypt located on a map of Africa and we can see that it's in the northeast of Africa. And here are some photos that I've collected over the years and we can see what the average tourist might be seeing in Egypt. So for example, there I am at the pyramids, um, in the market, by the river, looking at the large buildings. You can buy belly dancer outfits. You can buy beautiful food. This is an example of koshery. You could smoke shisha pipes if you wanted to. This is food in a local person's house. You can also get henna, and this is the beautiful sunsets that you can see every night. So let's have a look at some census figures. In 1882, 6,712,000 people were recorded. This crept up in 1897 to 9,669,000. And over the years, we can see a steady increase. And the last census, which was taken in 2017 on the 18th of April, we can see that there were 94 million 798,827 people registered. And it's been estimated in 2019 that there were more than 98 million and probably by 2020, more than 100 million. These are the administrative divisions and this is a map of Egypt and it's been um, fragmented into 27 regions. So the largest region here the New Valley, we can see that there were 249,000 people registered there. This is the Cairo area, which is the capital. And in Cairo, we have got 9,788,000 people. Nearby, we have got Giza with nearly 9 million. And we have got in the Suez region, 749,000. So we can see here that there are a lot of people centered around the capital. Let's learn some Egyptian numbers. And um, for example, one is Wahad, two, Ithnin, three, Talata, four, Araba, five, Kamsa, six, Seta, seven is Seba, eight is Tamania, nine is Tessera, 10 is Asherah. Apologies if my accent isn't brilliant. We can also see that these numbers have their roots in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 100 is Mia. Here are some useful genealogy words, and these will be on your handout. So let's go through a few greetings. So yes is Iwa, no is La, please Minfadlak, Thank you, shokran. You're welcome, afwan. Hello, salam alaikum. Goodbye, ma salam. Let's go, yalla. How are you, Zayek? I love you, Anna Bahabak. So let's now talk about births in Egypt. Girls and women often go to their mothers to give birth because your mother, your sisters and your aunties will be there to help you prepare. After the baby is born, the baby gets some paper ID. And on day seven, 
people come to celebrate the birth of the baby. So lots of relatives, lots of neighbours will come with gifts for the new baby. Probably the new mum would stay with her mother for about three to four weeks until she went home. The father would obviously come and see the baby and make sure that his wife was OK, but she would probably stay with her mum for three to four weeks. After this, she would go to the register office, get a certificate and an official seal or stamp. And here are some names which are popular at the moment. So for girls, Aisha, Mariam, Sarah, Aliyah, Zara. And for boys, popular names are Mohammed, Adam, Ishak, Zachariah, Ibrahim. It's interesting that in Egypt, people don't have what we might call a middle name. They utilize a chain of names and each person's name is their name, their father's name, their grandfather's name, their great grandfather's. So my friend Moman has allowed me to use um, a small tree here, like a pedigree, and we can see how his name has been formed. So his name is Moman Abdu Fattah Muhammad Taib. And we can see here that it is his name, father's name, grandfather's name, great grandfather's name. Useful to genealogists is that names can be spelt in a variety of ways and they are used interchangeably. So the spellings aren't always exact. So the name Mohammed could be spelled with a U, with an O, with one M. You could be shortened to Hamid or even Hamada. And all of these names are interchangeable and they're even interchangeable on official documents. So when you're searching for names, do try and be flexible. They're not as fixed as in the Western world. Let's now look at marriages. And these are heavily dependent on your social class and the residence of the families. In a traditional wedding, the bride and the groom would probably have an arranged marriage. And it's not that you've never seen the person before. The two fathers would arrange the marriage and it would be somebody local and may well even be your cousin. The bride wears an elaborate rented white dress, really beautiful dresses, and the groom would wear a galabea. The celebrations are separated for the men and the women and the local street is covered off for about three days. And there's a huge Arabic tent called a siwan, which would cover the street. When the bride and groom enter together, they are received by a zephyr, which is a singing parade of drummers. Whereas in the cities or urban weddings, you can choose a partner for love. And the bride wears a very fancy white dress, although it might not be rented, it might have been purchased. And the groom wears a tuxedo because the celebrations are often held in hotels. When the bride and groom enter together, they are also received the same as a traditional wedding by a singing parade of drummers. But quite often now, this would include belly dancers. For both traditional and urban or city weddings, the couple would get married in a mosque for Muslims and in a church for Christians. The night before the wedding, the bride would have a henna party. The ceremonies are often held on Thursday evenings because people can then go to Friday prayer the next day. The bride and groom sit on a special seat called a kosher and switch their wedding rings from their right to their left hands. And then the festivities, which is singing, dancing and eating can begin. For genealogists, an interesting fact is that women don't change their surnames when they get married. They keep their fathers. However, the children from that marriage do take their husband's name. And when you get your official marriage certificate, it's interesting that there is a separate photograph of the couple at the top of the document. Divorce is quite difficult and quite unusual still. And there is a difference between civil and religious marriages in the way that you can get a divorce. There is also an Orphi marriage, which could be called a sex license, because this is where um, the man and the lady agree to be married in front of a lawyer. Um, and therefore, they don't have any legal rights. And this marriage is performed in front of two witnesses. When somebody dies, 
the person's body is washed and they are wrapped in a white cloth, which is called a kafan. And within a maximum of a day, the body is taken to the mosque and people will pray for the deceased. Then the men will walk with the body to the local cemetery. After the funeral, somebody very close will take ID and register the death. If you wanted a subsequent certificate, only close relatives could get this. At the funeral, there is a separate wake for men and women. And again, the local streets are covered off with the huge Arabic tent, the Suwan. I found an interesting video on YouTube about preparing the body. And it does use a plastic dummy. So you could you watch this video and the link will be in the handout for you. And this will be the stages of washing and shrouding. So here we can see the wrapping of the body. Here are some words for relationships. Um, father would be alab or ob. Mother would be om. Son is walad. Daughter is bint. Husband, zauj. Mirati or Zauja for wife. Grandfather Jid, grandmother Jida. And we can see here that it's very important to know is it your paternal uncle or your maternal uncle? Is it your paternal aunt or your maternal aunt? And there are slight differences between those names. Interestingly, and something that I think is really lovely, is that when you have a child, you kind of lose your name and you were called the mother of that child or the father of that child. So in Egypt, I'm not Penny, I am Oma Shams. I am the mother of my daughter Shams. And referring to mothers and fathers by children's names is termed technonymy or pedonymics. This is an example of a family tree and my friend gave me permission to show this. And something that is quite interesting with Egyptian family trees is that the ladies aren't named. Let's now have a look at Egyptian DNA. And my daughter, um, her DNA has come back as Nigerian, Middle Eastern and Southern Europe. Spain and Italy. Interestingly, some of my friends who are Egyptian and come from Ismailia and Cairo have got a slightly different makeup to their DNA and they have got North African DNA, Middle Eastern and Jewish. So this reflects a completely different story, a different history, different, different travel routes, different trade routes and different religions having an in, a background here. If you wanted to translate anything, it's really quite easy now on the internet. You can translate most languages into Arabic and you can translate Arabic to any language. Here are some useful resources which will be on your handout. There's a family search wiki. You could look at Google Maps, Wikipedia. There's the government Egyptian website, the National Archives of Egypt, the National Archives in the UK have an Egypt section. And interestingly, my heritage does translate into Arabic if you go onto their website. So thank you for listening today. Shokran. I hope you can watch some of my other Roots Tech presentations. There's a sister talk to this called I Want My Mummy. There are also three adoption talks. If you want to stay in touch, you're very welcome. My email is penny underscore walters at talk21.com. My website is searchmypast.co.uk. Please download the syllabus or the handout for today. And just to let you know that I have authored two books, one of which is called Ethical Dilemmas in Genealogy, and the other is called The Psychology of Searching. And these are both available in paperback or Kindle on Amazon. I really hope that you enjoy the rest of your Roots Tech experience.